I'm not into the bad guys. If I wasn't playing Space Marines in the Imperium, <laughs> I'm into the good guys. I love it. Hello everyone and welcome back to All Around the World Leaders. My name is Darren, you're listening to The Red Path and today I am joined by the wonderful, enigmatic, charismatic Mike P from Warp Hammer. Dude, I've been so hyped to get you on the show for a, a long, long time and I finally have you here. How are you doing? Dara, I will say, as a fan of The Red Path, a fan of World Leaders and a fan of you as a person, I'm actually pretty hyped for this myself. I've been way too long and yeah, a lot to talk about in the world of 40k. That's for sure. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Um, and as a massive fan of Warhammer, and you as a person as well, thank <laughs> like, you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally thrilled about this. Um, yeah, like we've kind of been like, I suppose, in in loose contact for quite a while. Like, you know, I think you were you were like the yeah. OG person that we chatted to at the start of the Red Path before I was even like on it and stuff. So yeah, it, it goes way back. Oh, right. it was, I think it was Jamie one of the earlier calls. Another obvious yeah. legend of the world leaders, Jamie. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I've been watching some other interviews you've been doing with other World Eaters players. I know it's a good time. To, I mean, it's always a good time to be playing World Eaters, right? Is it ever not? You uh, a- eighth edition, mm-hmm. but, you know, since then it's been uphill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You and I were first talking back when we had one wound. Yes. On all Ooh, of our that's a different day. Good times, man. Yeah. <laughs> different times different times um but yeah and then we kind of like uh, i ran into you at lvo as well lvo 2023 it was i distinctly remember you arrived at my table with a bucket of beer <laughs> and just said take one and then probably disappeared for a while i'm gonna be honest I, I do sound i do sound guilty of doing things like that yeah, um I'm, I'm proud to say that was probably me it i think it certainly was um for anyone who doesn't know i am Mike is part of Warhammer, which is this phenomenal resource for competitively minded chaos players, and I suppose Warhammer players in in general, but particularly chaos. Um, you write a series of phenomenal articles, which every time one of them comes up, it's like one of the the few content platforms that I will always read every single thing that I see. So I think it's it's a credit to you and the team that uh, you always consistently put out some some good stuff. Um, so for anyone who's listening and hasn't checked out Warhammer yet, definitely, definitely hit that up. Um, but we always kick off the show with a, a little bit of a fun non-Warhammer related question and keeping in the theme of world Before. and eaters. Uh, Mike, where is the coolest or your favorite place in the world that you have visited? Well, I think it's a pretty easy choice right now. Just last month, um, it was kind of a lifelong dream to visit Peru and Machu Picchu specifically. And my girlfriend at the time really wanted to go um, i had a little surprise plan there because we've been together a while these are going super well i want to propose to her so wait until we're at the very top point of machu picchu and there's this beautiful view down on machu picchu it's called wayana picchu i believe i'm sorry if i butchered the pronunciation there and you get this beautiful view of the whole area you get all this history it's this long climb up um and that top point looking down at machu picchu is probably the favorite place i've ever visited not only for the views but also because i proposed there and knock on wood, somehow I tricked her into saying yes. So that's currently number one on my list by far. Um, have you ever man. been there? <laughs> <laughs> it is for it is for a lot of reasons. Have you ever been to Peru? Dude, I it's like literally one of the places that I haven't been that I am so desperate to go and see because I just love the all the like old ruins and stuff there. You know, it's it's just so cool. Oh, it's so cool. I will say though, um, altitude sickness, very, very real. So yeah. We're currently living in Denver, which is like famous in the U.S. for being like a mile above sea level, give or take. Um, so we thought it's a perfect time to go because we're going to be prepared, you know. We're already living a mile above sea level. Go to Peru. Easy game. Well, it turns out most of the places we visited were about three miles above sea level, a lot of the hiking we did. So basically like as high as Denver is, three times as high as that. And we were freaking exhausted and near collapsing a few times. So yeah, yeah just definitely tough. come prepared if you come to Peru. <laughs> Not a lot of oxygen going around up there. <laughs> no. Not enough anyway. That's that's no. uh, awesome though. What a what a lovely story, you know, to kick things off. Um Thank you, thank you. So do you have any start. travel of your own plan? Uh do I have any travel planned? I my next yeah. big trip is going to be um I'm actually I've been invited to no retreat in Gibraltar uh later oh, this beautiful. year. Yeah, beautiful. yeah. So hey, that's congrats, man. That's a that's going to be a big one. Um but 
Aside from that, not a huge amount, because I am actually also in the process of <laughs> saving for the wedding, which is next year, um, and that is going to be in Italy, so that is a... Big congrats, wow. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun travel as well, so... <laughs> Exciting times, exciting times. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's flip it over to to Warhammer again, probably what most people want to want to hear from us. Um, we're going to kick off the first half of the show with talking a little bit about like your journey through Warhammer and, and what kind of brought you to where you are now. But how did it all start for you, man? Like, uh, what was your exposure to and, and falling into the hole that is Warhammer? Sure. So it was actually a two-step process. The first Warhammer game I played was Age of Sigmar, because um, I'm not a long time like tabletop gamer, early gamer at all. I wasn't really into like, I say this in the nicest way possible. I wasn't into any nerdy stuff before discovering Warhammer. Again, I say that with love now, um, but I was playing. Let's see, I was into the Total War series, um, which is is like a video game that has like historical, like recreate like the Roman Empire and stuff, things of that nature. And you have like battles where you have like your different armies fighting. They made a game called Total War Warhammer, which is like that exact same game just set in the Warhammer universe. Um, I believe it's like the old world universe now. Again, there, I'm sure this is all like old news to you, but just for, for anyone listening that doesn't doesn't yeah, know this whole story. Context, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought Total War Warhammer was really cool. I was like, this seems fun. I'm kind of into it. I don't know what any of these armies are, but there's like, these dwarves are cool. I didn't like the elves, which has been a, a theme of my Warhammer experience from day one. I really didn't like yeah, the elves. Something tells me that's going to continue. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're so unlikable. It's their own fault. But yeah. Um, and then I found out there is a tabletop game uh, version of this. At the time, they didn't have the old world. It was like in between. It was like, I guess, AOS, like one or two, the first or second edition. Um, so I, check, I Googled, there was like a Warhammer store near me. I was going to go check it out. And I got a box of Skaven. So I thought that was Skaven really cool too. Um, so I got some Skaven. I built them. It was like 20 Plague Monks. Um, they were probably hobby disasters. I wish I'd kept them. Um, but then I had a friend I met online. It was a guy, Jonathan, one of the best guys out there. Love this guy. A friend from the East Coast. He was into 40k at the time. And he mentioned like, hey, do you want to try it out? Um, so we went together to a Warhammer store. We walked in because we wanted to start with Kill Team because it was like the cheaper way to start. Um, I was looking on the shelves and I was like, I want to find a 40k mini. And I saw the Plague Burst crawler, and that was like the first 40k mini I looked at. I was like, wow, that's really cool. It's not like fantasy, but it's still pretty cool. So I got myself a Plague Burst crawler and a box of Plague Marines. And I started building them, I started playing Kill Team. And then well, I was like, well, I've got like 100 points now, so I might as well build like a 2,000 point army. Because you know how it is. It's like a rabbit hole. You know, you get one or two minis in an army. 100 points, next job, 2,000, just like that. <laughs> but yeah, after, because I found out that's what everyone plays. And I was like, yeah. that's okay, we'll do this. Um, but I was actually ironically like super casual at first, um, just having fun. Um, just wanted to like push the minis around and watch them do cool things. I think honestly, I still feel that way. I'm probably known as like a competitive player these days for playing tournaments and stuff. But I still feel like I just kind of like pushing the little guys around and I, seeing I think, what they yeah, do. I get that vibe, you know, where it's like, yeah, you can play competitive yeah, yeah. and still like be totally into the like, oh yeah, like this is just fun, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's cool when the Death Guard guys walk up and like infect someone with a disease. That is. It Still just as cool as on the first day. Yeah. So yeah, I started with um, Death Guard, and then I got Admech Army, and then I sold both of those for... I've lost tracks. Now I have like eight armies. Um, and I've gone through like 12, because like a few of them have come and gone, like traded with friends or something, or, or sold online. But yeah, I started with Death Guard, because I thought they were really cool, and we just played Kill Team in his apartment, and then we eventually got up to full-scale games. That's awesome. Um, and inevitably, at some point... I mean, I'm I'm sensing mostly aside from the ad a theme of, of chaos, right? So like Absolutely. Yeah, what's up with that? Have you are you just like drawn to the bad guys, you know, the antagonists, or or how does that go? Is it just kind of like the aesthetic? Or is it like uh, how much of like the kind of I'm I'm guessing there's like a lore element as well that's pulling you in, right? It absolutely is. I did read a lot of the books. Um I will correct you though, Dara. I'm not into the bad guys if i wasn't be playing space marines in the imperium oh, i'm into the good guys i love it i love it for yeah. freedom and doing their own thing um but I, I will say i think the whole concept that really got me into 40k was learning about the chaos gods because that's kind of like the underlying theme of like every chaos army unless you play like night lords canal players are like really like 
touchy when you mention like the chaos gods and stuff. Yes. Yeah, I'm in very <laughs> slick running. <laughs> <laughs> they get very touchy those people <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, for like a million reasons um yeah i just thought the chaos gods were like a very cool concept of it's basically like 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 almost like congealed emotions like basically this like detritus like every living species like puts into the warp of like every like very strong emotion and like turns into like real things that then have an impact back in like the real space back um i just thought that whole like concept of the chaos gods was really cool yeah, how can so that's you not what, be into that, you know? It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why, I mean, spoiler alert, my, my favorite army is demons. Um, but that's why I think I've really enjoyed playing literally every Chaos army, because I just I love that core concept and how it's expressed in different ways, like across the various legions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's really cool. It's hard not to be drawn in by it. Um, but I guess, like, I mean, yeah. demons are, are your baby, right? Like, they're yeah. your main... A little cells. demonic grip loose. I love them all. Yeah. So, like, why them over, we'll say, you know, any of the, the Marine Legions or Chaos Knights or anything like that? What is it about demons? Is it that kind of, like, ethereal aspect that uh, that always pulls you back? Well, I think a big part of it is there's a lot of room for creativity with demons. Um, in the sense that you can just think of some really cool stories of, like, things that could only happen in the warp. Um, like, my, my Lord of Change, I have a backstory for him. Which is kind of sad because no, no, no. I haven't arrived Please. in a long time. Please. Um, <laughs> so but basically, good. my Lord of Change, I came up with a backstory for him, which is he calls himself Lord Zinch. And my Lord of Change literally thinks he is Zinch the Chaos God. And Zinch, the actual Chaos God, thinks it's so funny that this Lord of Change is so delusional. He keeps empowering him and like giving him like success so that like it furthers and furthers his delusion. But the whole time, Lord Zinch is actually working for the real God Zinch and doing his bidding. But he thinks he is like the the mastermind of everything, and Lord Zinch basically it's perfect Zinch, right? It's like exactly what it should be. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I don't know. I just I think there's a lot of room for creativity that there isn't in other factions that have at least some grounding in reality, or I guess like some grounding like humanity, um, or like other species, or like it was the warp. Like literally anything you make up is possible. Yeah, I mean, so like I there's think- there's literally no. No holes are barred when it comes to the warp. You know, you can do whatever you want and no one can give out to you exactly. either. <laughs> yeah, time, time can work however you want. Yep. Um, like, there's no real rules to follow in terms of organization. I mean, there, there kind of are a little bit, but by and large, you can kind of do what you want. You can create up, like, crazy backstories of, like, you, maybe your character was there for, like, a big historic event or, like, birthed in, like, a specific moment in history. Um, you have, like, different flavors. I don't know. I, I think if you play demons, you really have, like, full creativity with no restrictions at all whereas every other faction to some extent there is some restrictions yeah 100 percent. yeah i mean like yeah. you just have the perfect sandbox right you do you do and actually my one, one gripe with demons is for the the game's workshop line of demons at least is they're almost like a little too ground in reality mm. in the sense of i want to see like pink horrors that are not like like humanoid i guess human not really humanoid, but you see like like legs and arms and like still has like a shape of like a a living creature sort so to speak um but like a pink horror that's like just like maybe like a blob with like a random eye or like like just a random like square shape that's like shimmering oh, it's I was hard, hard say, to explain. no 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 it's because like just, one of my one of my buddies has a yeah. demon's army and all his horrors are just abstract shapes they're like triangles I've and squares that. that's your friend i've seen that yeah, one yeah, yeah. and he's it's, the coolest it's thing i've up, ever dude. seen the warhammer yeah, I need to get some more pictures from you. From your friends oh yeah, I can, I can track them down. Yeah, and like he has like an Iron yeah. Warriors contingent as well, and all of his spawn yeah. are like floating mechanical balls that just have loads of like oh, stuff so cool. coming out of them. It, it's just like I look at it, and every yeah, time yeah. I see it, I'm like, this is inspired. I just, it's, it's just perfect. It, it, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it actually is the perfect army, yeah. which I never thought was a thing. I, th- I want to say like, there's no such thing as a perfect army. Make whatever army you want, and that's true. But that army your friend has of like the abstract looking Zinch demons is actually the perfect army. It's so. it's just so cool. And like I really I get you there, you know, it's like the GW line, it is super grounded in like that kind of like uh sort of humanish uh body composition. You know, blood letters yeah. are like dudes with swords and like, you know, plague bears yeah. are dudes that stink, you know. So it's like you want <laughs> you want some stuff that it's like when people see this in the lore, they just lose their minds. So I'm like, okay, how's that going to kind of look on the tabletop, right? So it's it's a pretty tough yeah, one exactly. to, to kind of envision, yeah. 
I always think that the older blood letters, you know, the really freaky like snake ones that are just like super strange. They're like my favorite blood letters because I'm like they're so weird no, I'll, looking. I'll check them out. Probably sounds like it was a bit before my time, or, or, or to be honest, probably far before my time. In New it was far before my I time too. Shape. But yeah, I've seen pictures of them. It's like the S bend in the toilet. They look like that shape. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, that's but awesome. yeah, that's that's cool, man. Um, so kind of moving on from from the demons and stuff. Obviously, at some point you started playing the game competitively. Uh, was mm -hmm. that like a natural progression in your kind of career? Or was there like a, a switch where? Maybe you saw something or exposed to something and like, oh, that seems like something I'm going to do next. Well, it was it was a gradual introduction. My first tournament was not a singles tournament, but it was a doubles tournament. I played with a friend. It was one of those where you each bring like a thousand points and you play together on the same table. Um, because part of the issue I had was when I started Warhammer, much like many people, um, probably a very high percentage of casual players, I had heard awful things about tournament players, and I was like, wow, those guys sound like they smell, sound very rude. I don't want to spend my time there. So I was just playing like pickup games and like local group chats or like with friends I knew. Um, and I tried out the doubles tournament, had a lot of fun, and I realized people were a lot better than they were given credit for. But also, um, part of, and this is kind of either personality trait or personality flaw. I haven't figured this out yet. But like whenever I do something, I want to do it like very, very well to like the point I can teach other people. Um, like I'm not someone that has a lot of hobbies I enjoy. I've got maybe one or two at a time. I just want to like fully invest in those as much I, as much as I can because I do get a lot of enjoyment out of like a feeling of mastery, I guess. Which is not to say I'm like a perfect 40k player. I hope no one hears that as like a rude or self important thing. You're but my just more 40K like 40k player, Mike. <laughs> 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 maybe maybe tied with you but no, no it's like a thing where <laughs> hopefully what i'm saying makes sense of if i'm going to get into something i check it out i'm like okay this seems interesting well let me go all the way on this and part of that was much like i'm like just getting like enjoyment out of exploring different concepts for armies and exploring the lore i do enjoy making interesting things happen on the tabletop because i think ultimately like, when you play like at a higher level i think the gameplay is a lot more interesting than it is at a more, I don't want to say a lower level, because again, it's one of those things, it's not a judgment at all. But when you're playing like like a, a less experienced level or maybe a more casual level, um, the actual game decisions and mechanics can sometimes be a lot less interesting. Like when I'm playing competitively, like if you hear like a maybe a you know less experienced player, like here's like, oh, I'm like a melee person running against an army with fights first, that's just awful, I'm going to like die. Or there's no counterplay. Whereas I kind of enjoy thinking, okay, cool. So let me look at the game mechanics here. And like try to figure out how I can like find alternate solutions. Because that's a lot of playing competitively, is finding alternate solutions to situations that other players might not see. And I think that level of like just like I think the lore gives you a chance for creativity and self-expression, I think the tabletop and playing competitively gives you a lot of chance for exploration and creativity. Um and I, I mean I hope that's been reflected in Warhammer or Warhammer, this love of like exploring different things and finding creative solutions. But yeah, I mean, I think so it, it really is, you know, because like, well, thank you. I think that's like a really uh, succinct and excellent way of explaining. I, I don't want to say like justifying competitive play, but like, you know, explaining to someone who maybe isn't necessarily into it, why it can be so yeah. uh, addictive and compelling to do is like working out yeah, those puzzles, absolutely. you know, and there, there yeah. really is like nothing uh, more satisfying or fun when you're playing like an equal skilled opponent and you're both kind of working out that puzzle together almost at the tabletop you encounter yeah, situations yeah. and it's like oh wow this is really cool you know and and then you get through that and maybe you come away with the win or maybe you don't but either way it's going to be good right yeah and, and so that's why i think my my two favorite ways to play 40k number one would be like i guess competitively like a tournament setting but number two is also like super casually like playing with friends and like just like nonsense rule sets like i had this great game i played with the friends um a couple of years ago in anchorage i still remember this because we were playing, it was like four of us were all friends. And like mid game, we decided to be really funny. If we ripped off the magnetized arms or grading clean one, like scattered them around the battlefield and he had to go around and try to like reclaim them. <laughs> so I like, uh, yeah, I think for me, ultimately, like playing the tabletop is about creativity. Um, and I like if you're on the very far spectrum of like super casual, like nonsense rules and just like having fun making up a situation, that's amazing with friends. Or like playing competitively and trying to like explore the game's mechanics um, and find new solutions, that's really fun. 
the one kind of 40k I don't enjoy would be like i guess almost like semi-competitive in the sense of a lot of times when i hear people say like oh they're like semi-competitive i'm a little disappointed to find out they're not actually like casual or don't have like lore stuff they just want to play competitively poorly it was like <laughs> which is yeah. not in a rude way but hopefully people do get what i'm saying of i want to like if we're doing casual i want to be like super on a casual make it like a homebrew rule set random game just really have a lot of fun play nonsense or i'm playing competitively i want to be all in i want to be like fully exploring all the mechanics um coming up with different unique list ideas um the only thing i don't enjoy is like playing with like maybe handicap where people are like oh i want to try we don't want to try like too hard i'm like let's like figure out what we're doing here and then just go all in on that that makes sense so, yeah, yeah. I, I get it i get it and i like it um wicked man so obviously like dabbling into into competitive and stuff and and finding that you enjoyed it and that it's like a puzzle you want to solve uh and mm -hmm. i think it kind of harkens back to what you were saying about like you want to get so good at it that you can teach it to someone else was that what drove yeah. you to want to do warpammer like what kind of led you into this whole like oh actually not only do i want to play this competitively i want to make content based around my play experience yeah yeah um well part of one of the overarching goals of warpammer was make the resource I wish had existed when I started the hobby. I was like, so that was kind of early on. I was like literally thinking, what would Mike of like two years ago have enjoyed? Um, because I think a lot of the the discourse around 40k is very stale. Um, I think I think the Red Path does things very well in the sense of like remaining optimistic. We're looking for like new solutions to things. But like 90% of 40k comments or like discourse you see. Like, could like try to think how snarky I want to get. Okay, oh, um, please. <laughs> it, it honestly, could be replaced by like like a comment generator, and yeah, no one really knows. Right? Yeah, it's, it's all parroted. Um, it's a lot of complaining, and honestly, like I enjoy complaining a little bit. Drunk more, every forty k player enjoys complaining about how their army has been slighted or some like BS dice roll they had to deal with. Or like they, people love complaining. My I, I definitely complaint from you was when you complained about the world leaders on the Goonhammer article from the balanced status slate. I was like, my well, boy, listen, I, <laughs> he's saying I, I things that in... I wasn't even thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of that too is that um, I wanted a place that was positive because I think one of the issues is if an army is bad, people write it off entirely. Like, you know, like go ahead, see what the worst army in the game is. Go, like, just go right now, right now, post in like the... Yeah competitive facebook group or or the reddit page for that or like a big discord and be like how do i play this army and i guarantee you the first five comments are just be like lmao your army you're like completely useless or just like whining and or just i'm a little saying, play a different army or something you know yeah yeah whereas i think ultimately if you are a good player there is something there in every army that's not to say like oh you can like win lbo with any army that's objectively untrue but I think there is something interesting to explore in every army. And I don't want to say specific armies right now, because that's going to date this. But I think even if the army is bad, which I believe demons were at the time I started Warhammer, there's still cool stuff they can do on the tabletop. And there are mechanics that, if you use them well, will give you an advantage over other players. So I wanted to play, so I was like, okay, cool. We're not going to focus on complaining too much. Just a little bit of salt sprinkled in just to add a little flavor. But by and large, we're going to look into like exploring some underrated mechanics and have a place for people like, hey, I want to actually learn how to play this army, not like just like listen to people complain about this army. So that was kind of the early impetus on that, which I think one of my first articles was, it was about Beasts of Nurgle. I was around demons at the time, and I was like sitting around at work one day. I was looking at the data sheet, and I was like, this thing seems like giga busted. Let me share my enthusiasm for this unit with other people. And that's why I think the Warhammer community has really grown and become a place I and a lot of people love because people are brought in like, hey, I want to play this army to the best of my ability. I don't really care too much about how good it is. Or I want to find a way to use this unit. I don't care too much about how good that is. So looking for like-minded people um, was a big part of, of Warhammer. Yeah, I, I think it's really... Um... I suppose like grown and matured into something that really like embodies that as well because it's that really as he said that tone of positivity that i think brings people back because i know when i open up a warhammer article uh, i'm i'm not going to be like faced with kind of rants and, and raving and, and negativity yes. that that i might usually see you know um and that's that's really refreshing 
Or if it is, it's it's clearly contained in certain sections that are very much yeah, tongue in cheek. It's humorous, you know. It's like it's not. It's in humorous, nice yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. I yeah. think that, I, I, that I just... like mentality is is part of its success, right? Because you know, at some point, it's like you said, it's kind of like a common generator almost. Some of the times that you're reading stuff mm-hmm. or, or watching stuff, because I can watch a video on like it. We'll say the current state of the matter or whatever, and a lot yeah. of it, I'm like, I've heard all of this like so many times already. You know, it's it's never yeah. the conversation doesn't change, and there's not really. I would say like there's there's sometimes in 40k in general there's like a lack of like innovation or like drive for innovation mm-hmm. where um mm-hmm. people you know will just gravitate towards the next easiest thing to play whereas i think when you look at like warhammer it's like okay we have a, a really set and defined toolbox here how do we work with what that is yeah no i couldn't agree more i think ultimately a lot of it is getting to that more casual side of roots because again I, to this day i don't really concern myself a competitive player to myself a casual player that on a good day can play well. Um, so I think that people, whether they're more competitive or more casual, can hopefully find something something to enjoy. Although I will say, Dara, one of the things I need to do better about is making content more regularly. Because part of my issue is I only do it when I feel like very inspired on a topic. Mm. I'll be like, oh, this week do I want to make a content or do I want to make an article? Yeah, not really. There's nothing I really feel like I have to say. And I think that um that's the trap a lot of content creators fall in um especially some of the bigger ones is like making content just to make content so i think that helps keep the quality high in the sense of i was like oh every like five days i'm gonna publish something i guarantee you there'd be a lot of crap in there yeah um which not gonna what i think i've been able to largely avoid because i only wait i'm like cool i've written this it's like half written i'm just gonna wait until i feel like strongly motivated to work on in two weeks instead of like feeling like okay, i'm gonna push through it and just like get something out which again has has pros and cons um but it works out i think it works out well for everyone Not yeah, I think, like it helps maintain a certain level of quality when you have like the passion and drive behind it um and like you'll probably go through periods like i mean definitely right now <laughs> i'm going through a period of like furious content generation but like we'll say a month ago yeah. i published maybe one video in the whole month because i was just like i'm not really feeling the vibe right now you know and i think it's really important yeah. like you got to look after yourself as well when you're doing stuff that's like that, because if you're like, oh, I have to put out something every single week, yeah. you know, it becomes stressful, becomes forced, quality diminishes. And really, I think, especially for Warhammer um, and, and definitely to an extent, the Red Path as well, that element of positivity can be kind of drained away mm-hmm. because because of that. So I think it's like it, it's a, a credit to you that you've managed to maintain it over such a like lengthy period of time at this point. You know, it's been been going for, what, a couple of years now, at least three, four years. I have. Yeah, three, two to three sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably two and a half to three. But yeah, it does also help that 40k, at least for the last year, hasn't really been my main hobby. Um, so I've been getting like without getting too sidetracked, I got really into poker a few years ago and like put a bunch of study in and now play some pretty big games. Um, so that's kind of been like now that I'm viewing 40k as more of like something I want to do because of just purely for the enjoyment. I think that does that does help the content, as you're saying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we might cut back to kind of like a, a little bit more of like your your views on 40k in in part two, but I think for now we'll we'll cut awesome. off for part one. And uh, yeah, stay tuned, folks. Join us again for part two where we dive really deep into some abstract aspects about Warhammer. So stay tuned. We'll be coming up with that next. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two of All Around the World Leaders with Mike P. Uh, Mike, in part one, I asked you a fun little question about where your favorite place in the world was to visit. And the next part of every good world eaters word is, what is your favorite food to eat if it was put in front of you? Uh, that, that's a really tough question. First of all, thanks for having me back for part two. Um, you know, I'm always super excited to talk with you. But yeah, I'd say food wise. Food wise, we're looking at pulled pork just because it doesn't have the highest ceiling, but there's no way it can go wrong. I've low, literally low never skill had a bad... ceiling, high skill floor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you go to a new restaurant, you're like, if you get a pulled pork sandwich, it's going to be good. Yeah. Whereas I've had bad pizza, I've had bad ice cream, I've had bad, bad steaks, way overcooked or completely raw. Um, but I've never, ever had a bad pulled pork. So 
I'm at a new place. I don't know what to get. It's always going to be that beautiful old park. That's an interesting one. I feel like maybe over here in Europe, we don't have quite the same like reliability when it comes to pulled pork, you know, it can, oh, really? it can be really oh, nice. No. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Okay. Well, next, yeah. next time you go to LVI, we'll get dinner together one night. Let's do it. I'll show that you sounds, now. that sounds like a great date. Um, but yeah. yeah, so to kick it off back into the, into the 40 K stuff, um, recently you put out an article on warp hammer, which was like a revision of your core thoughts around um, yep. 10th edition. And I thought it was a really, really interesting article because you kind of revised a lot of your initial thinking. And I just want to pick your brain on how you're feeling about 10th edition right now in its current state. Absolutely. Um, honestly, I'm enjoying it a lot. Do I think it's perfect? No. But by GW standards, which is a pretty low bar, I think 10th edition is in a really great spot. Because one of the really tough things GW has to do is compared to other games like um I don't I don't really play a lot of other games, but like maybe like online games especially. Um the balancing can be done. There's like different kind of like fenced off areas. You can like rank people like people who play against similar skill levels or competitive levels. Whereas GW has to make a rule set that works for like every level of competitiveness and every level of experience versus every other level of experience and competitiveness. So they're in a trickier spot than people realize. And I think they have kind of nailed the balance between making a game that has, you know, crunch for competitive players to dive into, but also an ease of access for newer um, and more casual players. I do miss a lot of the customization of characters. That's probably my biggest regret of 10th edition. Like I know in previous editions, um, you could get a Whirler trait and a Relic. And say you had an attachment with six Whirler traits and six Relics that gave you 36 options for making a unique character, because you can take one of each, one from each table. In 10th edition, if you want to customize a character, each detachment has four enhancements. So you run from 36 possible unique characters to four unique characters, basically about, you know, a little over 10%, which is definitely felt. Um, characters don't feel as interesting. On the plus side, I do have to give them a lot of kudos for balance. The balance has been in the best spot, at least since I've ever been playing, which is like mid to late 8th edition. Um, the worst armies at any given point are far better than the worst armies were in previous editions. Like Dara, I know you and I were in the in the CSM trenches in eighth edition, and that was oh, just I mean, that was a really yeah, it was it was painful. Um, the worst armies at that time were really bad. Um, the worst army now, you know, Admec, um, can still win a lot of games. Like it's not like an embarrassment to put on the table. Now, obviously, Admec I think specifically has a lot of issues related to like fun and playstyle. But just in terms of raw balance, I think the game's in a really good spot. And I think if GW keeps that up for an entire edition, that'll be a really, really good sign for the future. Yeah, I think it, it's um, it's quite an interesting point. There was actually like a, a really big discussion on uh, Reddit today about it, actually, which uh, I was I was reading up on. Because we're, we're at a, a point where, you know, quite a, a few codexes are out now. You know, we've, we've got 10 yeah. on the horizon at time of recording. And a lot of these codexes on launch it's a very different experience from when ninth edition codexes launched, you know, where it was like every couple of months you would have the next oh, thing that's sure. killing the entire game. Yeah. Right. And now it's like, uh, it's very kind of side grady, I think, which creates an interesting situation. I think where, um, obviously it, it really helps on the balance side of things because yeah. no one has to worry about the upcoming codex like ruining the game like you you remember when tau came out in ninth edition right it oh was, my gosh it was yeah. uh custodes tau and eldar back to back and then nids right and that was that was a tough period to be playing the game in. oh for sure yeah, it was real real arms race but now um we're not really kind of like having that anymore and while i think it's great for balance i sort of feel like we don't have that same like rush of like oh my god how are we going to fight against this thing and working that puzzle out which can yeah. lead to a sense of kind of like um i don't know if it's like really like an uninteresting state because i still find it really interesting but like i think a lot of people have a gripe with the fact that when their book comes out they're not getting something that they're like oh my god this is so powerful i can't wait to try this thing and like how do you kind of like see all that in in the spectrum of how the new codexes are yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting perspective, and I see exactly what you're saying. Um, I guess I guess there is no right answer, because ultimately I think that's kind of the issue with a lot of 40K discussions, um, though especially when I say online, is like they think there's an objectively right answer. Um, I think each side has its pros and cons, because if there's consistent codex creep, 
that does keep things kind of fresh in the sense of even if you don't play the new really released army you have to like reevaluate okay cool what do i have that will deal with this like new tools change up your lists be like okay cool it's the freshness of um, constant fear right <laughs> <laughs> yeah well because i remember when when tau came out for example and they had really bad indirect um i don't was that how i think that describes a lot of like ninth edition eighth edition codexes but like when it, army came out i remember thinking okay cool like my list with a lot of like cheap chaff um and like one wound stuff is in a really bad spot because i think there was a lot of like five zero one indirect um that would just pick the stuff up, like cult us up by the bucket um so i'm like cool i gotta bring like new units off the shelf um or at least i feel like pressure to bring new units off the shelf which but for someone for example i'm in a position where i probably i was telling this up the other day i crossed the mark where i have over forty thousand points of chaos for 40k um so basically <laughs> yeah we've got we've got um we have I, I personally have a lot of opportunity to adapt to the meta and i at this point have a lot of connections that i can borrow models from but for someone that's maybe newer and only has exactly two thousand points of their army if a new codex comes out with like this new hotness that like completely invalidates their current list um that's got to be really frustrating and i think yeah. um as as more competitive players we definitely have to also keep that more newer and casual, like semi-competitive player in mind. Um, so I think Codex Creep is not as good for them. Um, but yeah, it, we've, it's a really weird spot where people are almost dreading their their tenth edition Codex. It's kind of strange. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like, I've never seen this before. It's it's unusual because I think the my perspective on it, and and maybe you agree or disagree with this, is like, it feels to me like everyone wants the game to be super balanced, but they want their specific army to be really interesting and have really powerful oh, that, rules. That is so, like, true. We can't, so true. We can't exist. Yeah. In, we can't have both at the same time, you know? Um, and like, I, I do worry a little bit, I think, that GW may pick up on the online sentiment of uh people not being happy with their codexes when it's coming out and kind of like retroactively buff the ones that are still to come out and i think that would create an extremely unbalanced power creep because you've got a whole swathe of factions that already have a book which has been you know fine and then you have these sure. factions coming out that are powerful so like in the in the in the like kind of view of codex creep it's almost like a worse version of it right no i mean i think that's that's a really sharp point um but I would also say that part of the issue I have with some of these 10th edition codexes is not as much their strength, which which you brought up some really good points about, but also like how they feel from like a fun perspective, which I'm going to use AdMech as an example again, because I know people consider me a chaos trader, but in 10th edition, I like, I like to start a new army every edition. So I chose AdMech. And I've been working on this dark mechanic conversion product project. Like I don't use any of their actual units, like I'm converting everything. So everything looks really different. That sounds amazing. Um, Love it. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I'm up to fifteen hundred points now. Um, a lot more in boxes, but we don't talk about that. Anyway, yeah, never. <laughs> um, and at the Atomic Codex came out. I played a few games with it, and I was like, "Cool, I can definitely win some games with this." I won most of the games I played with it, but it was very dreary. A lot of games played the same, and it didn't play how like I wanted the army to play. Mm. Like I know I don't think you play Atomic. I'm guessing. No, a... <laughs> my my brother does, so I I kind of have oh, okay, like cool. a sort of osmosis of his experience, basically. Sure, because I remember playing against them eighth and ninth edition. They were like the iconic army that's going to shoot you very hard. They're like very tech savvy. Oh, yeah. They got all these special fancy guns. Mm -hmm. They're going to shoot you very hard. Obviously, you know specific unit strengths and details will change edition to edition. But I thought that was like the admec play style. I start playing them. I'm like, I'm shooting these units. I'm like, I remember this unit when it shot me last edition. I was getting destroyed. Yeah, and I shoot it yeah. back at them. It's like a little pea shooter now. And it, it just felt really weird to play. Um, I think they're in a good spot because of points. But I think GW, I, I know you're talking about them retroactively buffing future codexes because they're seeing a lot of complaints. Um, I don't mind that as long as they also retroactively buff codexes that have come out. Oh, yeah. yeah um, I could see that being totally for fun. both For both strength yeah, and flavor. Like the the Bell, I think the Disintegrator tank. I remember this. This was a terror of my life in eighth and ninth edition. And I was so excited to be on the other side of that. Um, I definitely chose the wrong edition to be using it. So yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't think as long as they keep it consistent, which I think your worry comes from. Oh, it's GW. They're not going to be consistent. And I think that's a very very fair worry. You have a lot of but evidence to theory, suggest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a great track record. Yeah. But in theory, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. But. Yeah. 
I mean, I think they've been like really consistent with the power level of the current codexes. I I think yeah. like Th that's a very good point. You know, maybe Necrons are like I would say quite good, but like if you compare, yeah. we'll say um, when Death Guard came out in Ninth Edition to when Tau came out, like there was such a a vast gulf between those two uh, codexes. But like Necrons, it's really not that much higher than a lot of the indexes or a lot of the you know current codexes. Like I feel like Marines have great play into them. I personally think world leaders yeah. as like the you know the faction I rock is like going to be pretty decent into the crowns as well and like I've had good success so far into them which I would not have said for like when Tau dropped in ninth edition I was just like mm -hmm. all right cool do what you want yeah, because I'm, I'm just like, you win. Yeah, yeah 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 well just deck cross I don't want to get too far in the weeds because we're talking more general um I, I've thought a lot about world leaders versus necrons and I think a lot of that matchup depends on how many Catan they bring because we kill wraiths pretty well. Mm -hmm. Like Exalted Eight Bound, Normal Eight Bound are very happy to go into Wraiths. Um, they do absolutely nothing to Catan in my experience mm, with yeah. the, the half damage, because all that two damage. Um, you basically have like Angron, you've got maybe tank shocks around like Lord of Skulls and stuff, but it's definitely not not the spot you want to be. But anyway, I don't want to yeah. get too far down that weeds. It's just let me tell it's you, a little just, frustrating. just to close that one out, Karen and Ten Berserkers. That's a unit. Karn and, Karn and Ten Berserkers, that's the truth. <laughs> They only get activate really one time to Catan, but that one time will be. But mm, you'll get beautiful. that Catan. <laughs> you will. Yeah. As long as they don't roll roll way too many four ups, which is my experience first first Necron players. But I I had, it, I had a very there. scary like uh, introduction to that in in Coventry yeah. last year. Uh, this was before the Necron Codex was even out, and I was playing against a guy from Team Iceland, and he brought six Catan. And I didn't know what Catan did. Wow. Six, yeah, it was like that was basically the list. And they just walked yeah. around the board and my boys were like, uh oh. <laughs> but back then <laughs> yeah. I had I had the Berserker Glaive Mo who was like A plus back then, sure. you know. So yeah. he just went through a couple of Catan by himself as as he was wont to do. But uh we, we yeah. love and miss him dearly. <laughs> yeah. I will say one thing that's really cool about tenth edition is the balance between melee and shooting feels very good. Okay. Like I played armies because so many people don't don't think this is like correct. But I, well, I'm with I you think, on this. Yeah, it, it does kind of depend on terrain mm. um, a little bit. But I think in general, one of the great things about 10th edition, or I'd say one of the good things, because it's not perfect, but almost every unit type has at least one terrain set where it'll shine. Like, I think, for example, um, let's talk about like super heavy shooting units, like knights and like shadow swords and all that. That can be really good here over in the US where we use a lot of player place terrain. Um, smaller, faster shooting units, like like crisis units, um, a lot of Eldar stuff that can be super successful. Um, a lot of like big melee units, like Knight Lancers, Lord of Skulls. Although he's super shooty, but you, you kind of get what I'm saying. Um, can be very successful. And then also smaller, more MSU style melee units, like Exalted Eight Bound or um, Chosen Lords, for example, have all had like moments in the sun. I think this is like one of the first editions I'm playing where I'm like, you know, honestly, every list archetype can work. I think world eaters have shown that nearly pure melee lists can be super successful. Um, but I also think, I also think, for example, to the other end of the spectrum, um, armies like Tau have been very strong. Guard have been very strong, which I know I don't want to get a lot of hate in the comments for saying guard are strong. Let's, so let's oh, move on from that very quickly. Word. <laughs> <laughs> the, the danger. We're in the danger zone. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of shooting armies, like Eldar, when they were oppressive, they were basically pure shooting. Mm. Um, there's a lot of variety in play styles. Now, that doesn't mean every army can succeed with every play style, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Like, I don't think like a Forge Fiend castle with like Hellroots or whatever for world leaders is very good. But that's okay. Like world oh, leaders. Oh god, being, if Jamie listens, he's, he's going to be on to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, also, it does also depend on personal play style and terrain. Yeah. So maybe I know Jamie's a good player. I'm sure it works for him. But I don't think necessarily every army can succeed with every play style, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I don't think, yeah. you know, the archetype of world eater shooting list or guard melee list necessarily has to be a strong list. I think that's um, very fair. Yeah. Yeah. Large, large variety of play styles. I think, like, even when I'm considering for an upcoming tournament, like, there's a Rocky Mountain Open tomorrow, which I've no idea how I'm going to do because I've not practiced nearly enough recently, but that's, I've been focused on poker. But that's <laughs> totally fine. Cool. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have six nice. great games, and I'm excited for that. But the armies I was considering were Thousand Sons, just pure shooting. World Eaters with a Lord of Skulls, almost pure melee. Um, and then Greater Demon Spam, basically, I don't want to say Greater Demon Spam, but like mostly Greater Demons, like all large things. And then um, my Admech would have been almost all small things. 
So literally, like even like for one individual person for one event, there's a wide variety of play styles and unit and unit archetypes I was considering bringing. Um, and it just came down to what I had painted because I ran out of time to like get you know time to finish up the armies lead up to the event. So I picked demons. But yeah, you really you really can win with anything in 10th edition, which is a very rare point in 40k, and I don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah, oh, no, I'm, I'm so there with you. Like it's the diversity of archetypes and play styles that are coming out and winning events. It's like yeah. not at all consistent, which I'm just really, really enjoying because I mean, like you remember in eighth when like the um Castellan Three Blood Angel Captains and Loyal 32 were like the the sunshine for everyone. And you would just go to an event and you know you would see that exact list for at least like 25% of the players, right? Because yeah. they're just the people who are like, I want to win. And that this is the list that wins. And now we're really living in a world where it's kind of like, I've like, you know, practiced this specific archetype. Like maybe you're a world leaders sure. player who's like really put in the grind or you're like a, a T-Sons player who's like, I have worked out this like crazy tech with all the cabal stuff that's going to like rock people's world. Yeah. And like, that is no longer a pipe dream. Like you can actually just win an event if you like bring those things. And I'm like, that is fresh. It's exciting. When I'm reading about this stuff online, you know, reading tournament reports and stuff, I'm not just like, yeah. oh, here's the same thing over and over and over again. It's just like, oh yeah, sick. Okay. Like we had someone go six and oh at Cascade Clash from Team Red Path with three Mauler Fiends and two Forge Fiends and Angron last week. And that is when, wild. When absolute legend. Yeah. Like when absolute legend. I love, love the creativity in the Red Path. But I will say, um, I could not agree with you more. Um, I just had a point I was going to make and I dropped it. But yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you. Yeah, that's good. So, um, oh, actually, I just, I just oh, no, what go, I was quickly go. going to say. Yeah, one final thing is I think list by list building in a competitive sense is almost more difficult when there's not like one big bad on top of the meta. Oh yeah, for sure. Because say say it was like when Drakari were busted in ninth edition, and it was like literally just Drakari playing the game and then everyone else was playing the game. You're like, okay, cool. I'm going to build a list that will tech for Drukari. And if it's a good list into Drukari, they'll probably be good in the rest of the field. Or when Eldar were oppressive, I was like, cool. I'm basically building my list with one goal in mind. How am I going to match up into Eldar? And then I don't have to think about anything else because I'm like, cool. The best players will probably be running Eldar. And if a list is good enough to beat Eldar, it'll probably be good enough into everyone else. But now I'm like, okay, I'm building this list. And there's legitimately like, 10 plus armies I have to think about okay I'm likely to run into if I start 3-0 these armies I'm going to face on day 2 and there's not like one easy answer I'm like cool Yeah, it's not like if Necrons were like busted I'm like cool I'll bring like tech that kills Catan very well but you can't just think about oh I'm going to kill 5 Catan because there's like 10 other armies you're competing with at the top tables mm -hmm. I mean honestly maybe 15 I haven't done the math um, but like for example I was thinking about running Thousand Sons and I was like cool I think they're very good to Necrons I think on player place train they're very good into melee armies, um, very good into a lot of like slower shooting armies, like a lot of Death Guard builds. But they have a horrible matchup in the indirect, and unfortunately, guard are again. I, I don't want to go down the guard rabbit, hole, <laughs> but guard indirect right now is a very real factor you have to consider. Yeah. So I didn't. I it said no to Thousand Suns for that reason because they just can't really win that matchup. Mm -hmm. And I, I got lucky with the gamble. Like like almost ten percent of the field are running guard, and it's almost all copy paste. Like yeah. two Manta Core, two Basilisk, Medusa's lists. Um, but there is a lot more you have to think hard about your local meta more and about what armies you're likely to run into mm. rather than in previous editions where there's one or two big bads you have to attack for. I think it, it kind of, as an extension of that, it kind of um, forces people to like get better at the game and means people who are actually like Great good point. at the game yeah. are the ones who are winning rather than necessarily yeah, someone yeah. who either A, brought the best list in the game or B, brought the list to counter the best list in the game. Because now you yeah. have to be a player who can play into a variety of different armies. Um, you have yeah. to be good enough to have a plan for beating all those armies. So I think it really favors people who are like adaptable and able to like, you know, get the reps in and understand yeah, yeah. what's in front of them, even if they haven't necessarily repped that much into it. Great point. Although I, I will say what's interesting is you made a really good point that player skill is by far the number one factor right now. And I could not agree more with you. I think in previous editions, like number one factor was, you know, maybe player skill. It depends on how bad the meta was at the time, but probably player skill and then closely behind what army you brought. Um, I think what army you brought is much less important. So by far the number one factor in 10th edition is player skill, at least now that like Eldar have been nerfed, like the current point. Um, but the number two factor, I think there's a lot more of kind of a 
a slot machine you pull with the matchups you get. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say the army you brought is a lot less important, but the matchups you get, because there's much more variety and you can't tech for everything, has become more important. So I've talked to some friends that were they're really good players, um, and then I asked them how they went at the event. They're like, oh, I went 5-1 and one, or 4-1 and one or whatever, because one round I just ran into like a really hard counter on a really bad mission, and we just, you know, the skill gap wasn't large enough. Um, so yeah, I do think, yeah, the variance of the importance of the army you bring is much less important. There is a lot more of an element of, you know, especially if you're not bringing a busted army yourself, um, hoping to dodge certain matchups. Yeah, like world leaders and custodes basically is like the big one right now that everyone's talking yeah, yeah. about. Well, Even though I think at least money, you, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, if you haven't brought if you haven't brought lower skulls, yeah. um, it's 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 definitely a little bit tricky. Yeah, there's a couple of but, like yeah. you know I feel like every army has maybe like a litmus test or stat check where it's just kind of like if I run into that. I need to really like outscale my opponent, or if not, it's going to be yeah, yeah, exactly. a real struggle. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually curious, just before I move on, what would you say, like, as world leaders, you're like, I really, really hope to dodge this at an event? Uh, deck guard in the hands of a player as good as me. Deck guard? Yeah, that's a horrible matchup. Guard. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. if the player is like as good as me, I can beat them if it's custodes. Um, like, if we're, if we're looking at like equal skill, but deck guard, someone who's good as me, I'm, I'm never winning that game. I don't think. Or like you know, yeah, the stars need to align because that that's a really scary matchup, you know. Yeah, pretty pretty darn terrifying. Yeah, what would you say would be the the worst one in so like because obviously you got got quite a bit of experience with the eaters as well. I'm curious if you agree with that or if you think there's like a worse one. Yeah, no, I think Death Guard are a horrible matchup. Mm -hmm. um, I've mainly played the matchup a few times from the other side, and respect to my opponents, great guys. I do think I had a skill edge in those practice games. Um, but I remember thinking, like, how could I ever lose this? Like, mm. I'd have to like be completely throwing the game to possibly lose this matchup. Um, I think Death Guard are a horrible matchup. Um, I think Custodes are tough. So here's my, my hot take: is that even before the last data slate, when World Eaters were better and Custodes were worse, it was already a favored matchup for Custodes. Um, I think now it's it's probably pretty pretty darn bad for World Eaters. But obviously, as you say, there's always a skill component in these melee versus melee matchups. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely still win. It's not like it's not a point of despair. But I think like Death Guard versus World Leaders, you can haven't looked at the stats. But assuming it's like two very highly skilled players, it's probably like 80, 20, 90, 10 for Death Guard. I would, Custodes, I would say the same. probably yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably like 70, 30 for for custodians. Mm. What else is bad? Um I think on certain train sets, I oh I think guard are also very bad. It can be, yeah. It depends. Depends on both the lists there. I think heavily, but yeah, yeah guard, it definitely guard could does. be quite bad. Yeah, the Ogren Brig yeah. is like surprisingly very hard for world leaders to chew through. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But not even that. Um, their indirect profiles match up very well mm -hmm. into world leaders. Like Manticores love shooting basically everything you have. Basilisks giving you minus two to move, advance, and charge. Very bad. Um, if they're gaming with Medusas, those are also very good. Um, tank commanders not super long range. But you're coming to them. Um, tank commanders fight on death or shoot on death is really annoying. Now they can shoot into their own melee because out of phase big gun never tires, but they can shoot into other units, which is really annoying. Um, they have a lot of cheap stuff that if they use it well, they'll deny you a lot of good charges. Um, the one good thing about the guard matchup is in most of the lists they bring, unless they're like bringing Gaunt's Ghosts, which maybe like 30% of lists are, um, they don't have any uh, infiltrate, just scout it themselves. So if you go first, you can do a lot of damage. Yeah, it's definitely not not a place you want to be in. Um, also, cheap transports like they can bring a couple of chimeras, and those are very annoying for world eaters. Um, so yeah, I'd say yeah, I'd say that's that's an unfavorite matchup. But it, it's one of those matchups where if you have a big skill edge, and you go first, I think you can still feel feel solid. It's, yeah. it's an uphill battle. And I mean, they're it's guard players, right? So you probably got the skill edge. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had to and, slip and, it and in, prob <laughs> and, and probably the list edge. But yeah. yeah, no, I think that's that's a very interesting matchup. Um, also, I think Thousand Suns can be really bad, mm, but yeah. again, like there's very few very good Thousand Suns players. Yeah. Um, and again, not to you know reiterate the point, but they have no infiltrate. They just have potentially some scout with their cultists. Um, but if you go first and get the right mission, you're just absolutely gaming. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, that's that's like a matchup that's very coin flippy. Yeah. Um, I think the, yeah. the the main issue for world leaders at the minute is like every game well mo most games feel like you're playing like 5d chess unless there's like a massive skill gap in your favor um but like because you've got like very you know everything's like so expensive it's probably very similar for demons uh because you got the whole realm of chaos phase that you need to like consider 
but like every game is like a high mental sure. load and in a tournament if you start to do quite well you know you're going like four and oh five and oh those last games are very very tiring because you've had to play like quite a lot of games at like a high level yeah. um and your opponent may or may not depending on the faction they're running well i mean i will push back a tiny bit um not that i think world leaders don't fit that bucket i think you nailed that point but i think basically every faction that's good now like there's very little like just coast to the top tables factions or lists right now um probably the closest i can think of is the storm raven list the iron storm storm yeah. ravens yeah um that my good friend kit developed and unleashed unleashed upon the meta unfortunately but even that like if it's like a player that doesn't really know what they're doing they're just going to throw games because there is a lot the of storm ravens shit. wrong or like you know just don't don't play correctly it's it's still going to be painful. yeah yeah you do have to plan out a lot of like where they're going to move because there's a lot of like auras and like like order of operations is very important um i can't really think of any list i'm like wow okay i saw it. this guy's currently started like four one or whatever but he might just be awful when we get to the table there's really nothing like that right now which i think is a sign of how healthy the game is right now definitely um, yeah, at least yeah. from a competitive perspective yeah I want to pick your brain a little bit um, to, to kind of like start finishing up on this one, but I want to pick your brain on demons sure. um, because that's your baby. Oh, I and love them. I love demons as well. I've got a ton of demons. I've never played them in a tournaments uh, as outside of allies. And I want to know how you're feeling about like in general demons right now and what you're maybe hoping for in the future for the demons. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I love my demonic Ribblies. Like they're one of those armies that whenever I don't play demons for a few months, like I'll be playing Death Guard and World Eaters and Thousand Suns and, and CSM and Cast Knights. Um, but then I get back to my demons, I'm like, it just feels right playing them. Like I just I feel like my heart feels very happy seeing my my demons on the table. It's like you've come home. Which is <laughs> Exactly. It's like I've come home. It's like, hey, hey guys, I missed you. Um Mike's home, let's have a good time. So demons, I think they're in an interesting spot. Um I think so demons have a few specific mechanics that I think are very strong. Um, that if you lean into those, you'll do well. Um, because I think, like fundamentally, Bellacor has this aura of a six-inch aura around him of units within six, not wholly within, just within six, can't be shot outside of 18. Um, and when basically, the way I like to build my demons lists is I'm like, cool, so I have an army that literally can't be shot. Um, then, apologies. Um, I've got an army that can't be shot, and I'll load up on shooting units, which I think Soul Grinders are the best shooting unit right now in Demons, so I bring three of them. I'm like, cool. I like the way it shapes deployment, because if you think about it, they don't want to, like, slot, you know, Soul Grinders are kind of a slot machine offensively. They're not reliable for me, but when they, like, swing up, they swing really, really up. D3 shots, 2 plus D6 damage. So the opponent has to hide their valuable stuff from my Soul Grinders. And, and in turn, I can position very aggressively. Now, because they have to hide kind of further behind terrain, that makes it even more difficult for them to get within 18 inches to shoot me back. So basically, I've always won the deployment phase with demons just by showing up, um, which I think that's really cool. That's not really talked about enough. There's like different phases of the game. Armies have certain strengths. Demons are incredibly strong in the deployment phase because of the kind of the asymmetric nature of how our guns work. Um, now, I think part of the issue is our melee is actually weirdly bad. Um, outside of the corn, like triple red master rabbit hole, um, and like specific data, se data sheets like Shalaxi. Like, I think almost all of our melee is pretty bad for the points, which is kind of weird to think about. But like, Keepers of Secrets, I think they're incredible, one of the tankiest and fastest students in the game. They do very little damage. Like, they absolutely cannot scratch anything T9 or higher, higher than strength eight. Um, great and clean one, same thing. He's strength eight, a little bit of lethal hits, maybe get one lethal, but D6 damage on the six attacks. He does really nothing in melee. Soul Grinders, they hit on threes with no rerolls, and only have medium AP. So um, outside of their tank shock, they're super unreliable in melee. And Bellacor, like, four 350 points is absolutely awful offensively. Like, 350 points to base anything else in the game would be better than Bellacor offensively. So you're at a point where you're very good in deployment, and you're very good at scoring secondaries, because you have your Realm of Chaos, so you can pick up two units um, every single turn. Including if they go first, then you get pick up two units and you can start like three inch deep striking for homers or whatever. Um, and also because we have cheap access to nerglings that are like early secondary masters, like I always deploy in a way that I'll have a nergling unit 
with like 10.9 inches from the very center of the battlefield, because that means if I get homers, turn one, they move five, they're now within six to do homers. Or I'll have a unit, maybe a unit of, um, you know, nerglings, or like a lone op character set up, that they are their movement, plus nine inches from the two corners of the battlefield on my side. So if I can investigate signals, turn one, boom, guaranteed four points. Um, and I also like to bring enough nerglings that I can also have some to do actions if I go first, and then some to like set up move blocks. So the army is like fundamentally good at secondaries, and we're very fundamentally good at deployment, um, but we do kind of sometimes lose wars of attrition, just because our damage output is so inconsistent. So I think the army is very good, um, but it does require a lot of a lot of finesse to play. I think if you're just kind of a newer player, you're like, cool, I've got a bunch of greater demons. We're just going to like deploy in the line, maybe not even bring Bellic works. I see a lot of people doing for some reason. I don't fully understand. We just bring a lot of greater demons. We're going to play in the line or like rush up. We're going to have like four pinballs. You'll just get like shot to pieces and you're not going to win that war. So yeah, I think demons are all about, um, you basically use Bellicor, like you build around Bellicor. And every single turn is planned around Bellicor in the sense of, okay, where do I need to have them to give out shadow to give advance and charge or to deep strike people in or to make someone unshootable? Um, basically, you, you set up your turns, you plan where's Bellicor going to be or basically where do I need to go where do you need to have like my most important stuff? Bellicor goes there, and then you kind of build around that. Um, like I remember some demons players were saying like they don't like Bellicor because like he gets like shot up early, and I was like I don't fully understand what you're doing in your games that oh. Bellicor is dying early. <laughs> yeah. Like that that seems like a thing that like should fundamentally never happen if you're pre measuring correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've kind of rambled because I, I love demons so much. But basically, no, they're very good yeah, at deployment. It's really interesting. Yeah, very good at secondaries. Um, and they're very good at denying the opponent's game plan. Like, if they take fixed assassin, they bring it down. I love that. That is the best case scenario. Because I will just cycle cycle guys out there that are wounded. It's very tough to, like, very slippery to, to nail down if you have to kill us. Mm, yeah. But at the same time, our offense is so inconsistent and unreliable um, that we can sometimes run into some bad matchup submissions. So yeah, 10 out of 10 in deployment, 10 out of 10 in secondaries, um, like, 9 out of 10 in denying the opponent's game plan and denying kills, but like four out of ten in their own damage. So you have to play around their weaknesses, but if you play around their weaknesses, they can do very well. It's an interesting one, yeah. So would you say like uh on the topic of like what you would hope for for the demons in future, maybe like a some probably not across the board increases the damage because that might be a bit much, right? But like definitely some units like seeing a little bit of a glow up, do you think? Oh yeah, I th I think I totally forgot the part of the question. I think one of the most important things I want to see is more rewards for running Mono God, which I think the demons are really, really good method for the Codex. Um, because I think right now, there's like very little synergy between units of the same god. Um, like in my list, I don't even consider that. People are like, oh, you're bringing a Keeper of Secrets, has an aura of plus one AP for Slanesh Demons. Like, do you want to bring Slanesh Demons to like lean on that? I'm like, no, that is not nearly enough of a reason to run Mono God or like run a lot of other units, which I don't think are very efficient. Or like my great and clean one has a six inch aura of a six up feel no pain for Nurgle demons. I've got some Nurglings and plague bearers. People are like, oh, do you want to like, do you keep them by the great and clean one for the feel no pain? I'm like, oh, I totally forget that rule exists. I've like, there are times in games where I've had Nurgle units by the great and clean one. And that rule is like so irrelevant. It's like the power just, just and how I plan to use those that. units. It doesn't even come up. <laughs> yeah, of course, um, of course. So I, I think there's a lot of situations where units like demons right now list build by battlefield role synergy. Like I have this unit to like tank, this unit to like be fast, this unit to like teleport around and score points. But there's no real synergy thought about between the data sheets other than Bellacore. Mm. Um, I want to see in the future attachments that reward you for taking pure Nurgle or like a lot of Nurgle. Yeah, which is um, like almost a guarantee, right? I mean, like I think it's a, a safe bet to assume that, that, that that's probably going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also want to see a little bit more flavor for a lot of data sheets. Mm. Like I think Bellacore is really cool to use. Soul Grinder is really cool to use because like you can choose the mark and then they get different guns. I think that's yeah, a pretty cool mechanic. For sure. Um, but right now, a lot of data sheets are kind of not as interesting as they should be. Um, I'd love to see some work done on that. Like I'm trying to think of examples. Um, I think blood letters are pretty like. <laughs> oh, blood letters! Oh they're, my gosh, they're pretty lame. <laughs> what, what, what a sad little data sheet. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I was excited to run them after the last points dropped to 120, and I ran them. I was like, wait, they're still awful. I don't know what I'm doing here with my life. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, every time I'm like, oh, I can ally those guys in, and I pull up their data sheet, and I'm like, but why would I? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think on the topic, I think like bloodthirsters are kind of boring. I think Scarbrand's kind of boring. Um, not in the sense of, like I don't I love the models. I think they're incredible models, really fun to use in theory, but the rules aren't that interesting on the tabletop. Like, um, maybe a Scarbrand, like for example, when he had his like aura of plus one attack for everyone, including the opponents. Um, right now, it's only your own non-monsters and vehicles, so he doesn't even benefit other bloodthirsters, which is really weird to think about. Um, it was really cool. It was like a unique mechanic. Like opponents, like would see it, they're like, "Oh, I've never like heard that's yeah, even a thing in the game." And I love that for um, demons because they they used to have so much of that, right? Where it's just like, yeah, yeah you wouldn't see this anywhere except for the demons army. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but right now, it's like bloodthirster gives an aura of plus one to hit, mm. which is like really boring. Maybe like he shapes the area of the battlefield so like units within six can like always like advance and charge because like extra angry or like or uh, opponents within or like friendly units within six like fight on death or something i have no idea how access how corn doesn't have access to any fight on death it's absolutely ridiculous yeah. to me um yeah i want to see more flavor ads today she's like great and clean ones right now um they're just basically like a cheap wool of wounds for the points and that's valuable don't get me wrong like i always run one in my list but i want to see him do more interesting things like like you know, maybe, you know, give out like a disease, like you choose, like you randomly roll in your command phase, like a D3 and you get like a random benefit. Like you get like one disease, like units shot by him on a one, like they're minus one save for the rest of the turn. On like a two, they like have to receive movement, kind of like Death Guard do. I, I don't know, like I'm just spitballing here, but some like unique mechanics. I also want to see more randomness, which is weird to say. Oh gosh. But again, my perspective chaos is more... randomness rabbit hole that inevitably happens. <laughs> exactly. Like again, my perspective is more from the player of like, plays competitively but like is it definitely casual at heart mm. um i think things like the warp storm table were really cool just because i like mechanics that you don't neither you nor your opponent know exactly what's going to happen and then you both have to play around those and that gives me an edge because i have more experience with the mechanic than my mm -hmm. opponent does so there's like an asymmetric information advantage not information like i would hide the information of course i'm very very forthcoming to the point of a fault like they're like stop telling me stuff i know <laughs> um but things like warp storm i just have more experience playing around the mechanic and like know the likelihood of various outcomes or um just in general like maybe like you know like a warp storm thing like the start of the, each command phase you roll a d6 and there's a random effect applied to the battlefield like all units are like minus one move or something to show like nurgle's ascendant um and like your nurgle units ignore that or like you roll a d6 and like on a like a four like all units on the battlefield get plus one attack for both you and your opponent and if there's a core and demon unit, they get plus two attacks, like something like that, like yeah, randomness with like like, additional yeah, like yeah. yeah, it's kind of like like a, a loaded dice towards you. It's random, but does benefit you more on average. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just want to see them put more thought in making demons because like demons is like a completely blank canvas. You can do whatever you want with them rules wise. So take advantage of that. Make them creative. Make them fun, and that'll be good for both you as a demons player and your opponent seeing some new fun mechanics. Yeah. For sure. Like, I mean, I, I always remember playing against them in, in previous editions, and I was just like, man, this is going to be wild. Like, who knows what's going to happen here, especially with the Warp Exactly. Storm. I was just like, this thing is crazy. And now yeah, world yeah. leaders kind of have it with the Blood Dice, I guess. But yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, dude, um, I think that that takes us up to about the end of the show. Is there anything you want to say before we close this one out? Anyone you want to shout out or anything like that? Um, no, I just had a ton of fun chatting with you, and I mean, I love the Red Path. Always happy to hang out. Um, I do apologize for rambled a little too long, especially when Stevens came out. Not at all. Um, but <laughs> it's hopefully, all hopefully, it's all gold. Yeah. Um, any shout outs? Honestly, no. Um, I just want to give a shout out to all the people listening that went like zero and six, or like one and fourth, or last event, and stuck out the whole event. You're all legends, and onwards and upwards. Um, in terms of Warhammer. Honestly, I don't even have any content planned up because it's a really busy week. Um, playing some poker tournaments and then RMO this weekend and just got back from traveling to Alaska to visit some friends. Um, so at some point, I'll have some content to plug, but just for right now, um, check out Warhammer when the next article comes out um, and just be a good opponent whenever you're playing games. So oh, yeah. that's it. it <laughs> just shout out to all the, all the good sports out there. Amazing. I love it. Well, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in for this episode of All Around the World Leaders. I've been Dara, and this has been Mike P from Warpammer. I will leave a link down below for Warpammer, and make sure you check it out if you haven't already. But until the next one, folks, stay healthy, stay safe, and kill, maim, burn.